Hi everyone, um, thanks for having me. Um, so this is gonna be a presentation, um, part of our QI project we're doing uh, with Dr. Agarwal. Uh, Sananda um, is also involved as well as Heba and Kirthana as well. Um, basically, um, we wanna talk about a practical approach to inpatient management of hyperglycemia in our non-critically ill patients. You see a lot of these on the floors. Um, I sent the link in the chat, but if you want to use this QR code scanner to just do a pre-survey, there'll be a post-survey afterwards. Both will take about under five minutes. Um, help us gather data to see uh, how our uh, presentation is helping uh, the management and hopefully help you on the floors as well. So with that, we'll get into it. So some learning objectives for today. Um, we're going to talk about glycemic targets and hospitalized patients anti-hyperglycemic agents, blood glucose monitoring and prevention of hypoglycemia, consultation to diabetes care providers or endocrinology, and then discharge recommendations as well. If anyone has any questions, uh, feel free to interrupt me. So a little bit of background, um, inpatient hyperglycemia affects patients both with diabetes and with no history of diabetes. Um, it's important to recognize um, that in the hospital, both hyper and hypoglycemia are associated with adverse incomes, even including death. Uh, therefore, our inpatient goal should include the prevention of both hyper and hypoglycemia. Um, as uh, people, in the, as a presence in the hospital, with our teams, we want to promote the shortest safe hospital stay and effective transition out of the hospital that prevents any acute complications or uh, readmission. Um, and then understanding that for patients without diabetes, hyperglycemia may have a worse outcome. Studies have shown that uh, newly diagnosed hyperglycemia or stress hyperglycemia leads to longer time of hospitalization, higher admission rates to ICUs, and higher rates of discharge to uh, long-term care homes. Um, so our goal is always to establish a protocol for structured patient care and structured order sets and um, avoid uh, hyper and hypoglycemia. So alluding to um, the uh, how uh, risk, how a uh, sorry, um, how hyperglycemia can be an important marker of uh, mortality. We have this study that was done in 2000. Uh, this was a retrospective study of about uh, 2,000 patients with uh, new hyperglycemia um, with admission or in hospital fasting glucose greater than 126 or random glucose greater than 200. Um, you can see um, that the patient study that was involved, about 12% had this new hyperglycemia, aka they never had diabetes before, but had the hyperglycemia present and 29 of this 12% uh, were ICU patients. Known diabetics were 26 and 14% were ICU. And the rest of the um, participants in the study were normal glycemic patients and only 9% were in the ICU. However, you can see by the graph on the right um, that I, the results show that inpatient, inpatient hospital hyperglycemia was a important marker of poor clinical outcome and uh, inpatient mortality. Um, and you can see that those, especially with newly diagnosed hyperglycemia, had significant amounts of inpatient, uh, a significant percentage of inpatient mortality compared to those with known diabetes or their normal glycemic counterparts. And also, I'm sure you've all seen with our COVID patients, uh, we've had some uncontrolled hyperglycemia, um, which affects their mortality as well. So just a brief overview of some uh, diabetes statistics. Uh, during 1999 to 2016, there was an increase, significant increase in total diabetes among adults 18 years of age or older. Um, around the turn of uh, the millennia, it was about 9.5%. And about 2013 to 2016, it was about 12%. And it's been increasingly encountered in hospital patients, whether or not the primary um, whether or not related to the primary reason for admission or any comorbidities uh, that were addressed during the hospital stay. And in 2018, um, it was uh, estimated that about 34 million people of all ages or 10.5% of the US population have diabetes. And that's uh, only projected to increase. So essentially um, one in 10 of people in the population um, have diabetes. And I'm sure you've seen more than that percentage that we manage while in hospital. Where I go. So uh, speaking of some definitions, uh, just to clarify, uh, the ADA or the American Diabetes Association uh, had a standards of medical care and diabetes in 2016, which they update every so often. And they recommend an inpatient glucose target between 140 and 180 uh, for all inpatient, including ICU. Uh, this was shown in the NICE sugar study, which I'll talk about on the next slide. Uh, this uh, recommendation comes with a pre-meal blood glucose of less than 140 and a random blood glucose of less than 180. 
but there can be some specific clinical situations where you want a higher or lower target, this higher target below 200 overall, um, or some patients with terminal illness, um, limited life expectancy, or high hypoglycemia risk. And then this lower target about 100 to 140 um, are patients who are able to achieve and maintain glycemic control without experiencing hypoglycemia. Next is stress hyperglycemia. Um, this is a glucose elevation with no known history of diabetes or normal HbA1c, which is uh, less than 6.5. Again, our pre-diabetic range is 5.7 to 6.5, but still not technically diabetes. So again, MC encountered our non-diabetic patients. Um, and uh, peri-admission A1c can help distinguish a patient who has no diabetes and is just experiencing this stress hyperglycemia or it can show that a patient has previously undiagnosed diabetes and a uh, new hyperglycemia related to that. Um, and next is hypoglycemia. According to the ADA, this is a blood glucose of less than 70. We get to severe hypoglycemia, hypoglycemia with a blood glucose of less than 54, which can also be characterized by altered mental or physical status requiring assistance in the hospital. And different values may define hypoglycemia and severe hypoglycemia in different situations. Uh, the thresholds are chosen to help standardize um, and uh, hospital care, hospital management, and provide a margin of safety. Um, and for example, a normal patient could have a glucose less than 70 and not truly be hypoglycemic. But if we're actively managing blood glucose, any gl blood glucose less than 70 should be treated as low. Um, and this could be related to catching a measurement uh, on a downward trajectory, um, given the use of certain anti-diabetic medications. And I'm sure most of you have ordered uh, insulin before. When you go to the diabetic agent order set, you see that um, the hypoglycemia uh, protocol is automatically triggered. And this is because we always want to rigorously avoid hypoglycemia. This will not only show uh, to alert the, uh, to let the nurses know to alert the um, resident or team when glucose um, requires some intervention. A lot of our nurses do give uh, like juice, uh, but there is uh, other uh, measures, whether oral or IV, that can be given uh, based on certain measurements. So it's always good that these are checked off and help assist us. And lastly, all these definitions apply to patients treated in patient setting um, with, anti with anti-diabetic medications, whether oral or injectable, or whether insulin or non-insulin agents. So going on to the nice sugar study, some of you may have heard this about this before. This was an intensive versus conventional glucose control in critically ill patients. Uh, this is a multi-center, um, non-blinded, randomized controlled trial of about 6,000 patients. And they were divided into two groups. Um, one was the intensive uh, control goal uh, control group, which was a goal of 81 to 108 blood sugar. Um, and then the conventional was just less than 180 in general. And this was an intention to treat study, meaning they were actively treating the patients, uh, not only for sugar, but however they were, um, whatever they were being treated for in the hospital. But the primary outcome was 90 day mortality. So you can see based on this uh, graph right here that uh, the intensive group actually had a significantly higher uh, mortality, 90 day mortality than the conventional group, about 2.6%. So this is why we choose this 140 to 180 goal especially in our critically ill patients. So next I'm gonna talk about our diabetes medications, our anti-hyperglycemic agents. Um, insulin therapy should be initiated for treatment of persistent hyperglycemia, starting at a threshold of 180. Um, and we do give it to our diabetic patients regardless of what home medications they're on. We like to use insulin uh, versus uh, oral anti-diabetic agents. Um, it's kind of like, if you think about it, like heparin in our cardiac patients, um, it's easy to adjust, um, has relatively shorter half-life, and it makes managing um, our hyperglycemia, hypoglycemia a lot, uh, a lot easier. So many we, uh, the most um, prevalent ones we use uh, in our practice are the basal and bolus, or the long-acting, the short-acting. Short most of us use glargine, there's also uh, levomere. Uh, these are our long acting insulins and you can see it uh, demonstrated on this flat red line right here. Um, so our long acting insulin, um, onset of action is about two to four hours. Uh, it's peak action, uh, there is no peak action. And it lasts about 20 to 24 hours, which is why we usually give it, um, or we do give it every 24 hours, typically around the same time. Uh, and we like to move before bedtime because um, while we sleep, we're not eating, um, we can we can have some nighttime hyperglycemia, some nighttime hypoglycemia. And because it doesn't have the peak, it is relatively good at 
uh, maintaining our sugar levels while uh, not active, but also not eating. And next we have our short acting insulin. This is our Lispro, this is our bolus uh, insulin, also known as Aspart. Um, and it's uh, represented by this black curve right here. It's very quick acting. It's also used in our sliding scale as well, as you know. Um, it's onset of action is about five to 15 minutes, lasts about 30 to 90 minutes and has a duration of four to six hours. And uh, that's why uh, when we have patients who are NPO, um, we like to use their sliding scale um, along with um, long acting insulin because uh, we like to set the sliding scale every four to six hours, usually six hours, just because of how long it lasts. Um, the last one is regular insulin. You may see this sometimes used in insulin drips for DKA HHS, um, but these uh, we're talking about non-critically ill patients here. Other ones are not used so much in patients. So uh, this slide uh, is from the University of Michigan um, Endocrinology Department. And what we see here is we see a normal insulin profile and a normal glucose profile for a person without diabetes eating three meals a day. It's your classic layman's person. Uh, so you always see over here that there is a, always a basal level of circulating insulin. And this serves to suppress glucose and ketone production uh, in periods of fasting. Uh, especially like while we're sleeping. Uh, this component of insulin is referred to as our basal insulin and it's relatively constant. And this matches up with our basal glucose, um, the glucose one would have when fasting. And note that glucose never falls to zero um, as the liver is always uh, producing glucose via gluconeogenesis and glycogenolysis. This is our glucose that helps us while we're sitting in chair in this lecture, trying to sit up, helping our small muscles uh, keep us awake. Um, so you see here that the glucose levels rise, sorry, split screen, that's why I'm moving my head around, um, in response uh, when a person eats a meal. And when this occurs, we have a physiological response uh, of insulin. Um, and we see that this uh, insulin rapidly increases along with the glucose and shows how closely how our insulin and glucose match up with each other. And this rise in insulin above the basal insulin is called our nutritional insulin as it's uh, correlated with our nutritional uh, intake. Now, a normal human, this person I described above, no diabetes, eating three meals a day, um, secretes about a total of 25 to 30 units of insulin per day. About half of this is secreted as our basal insulin and half of this is our nutritional insulin. So you kind of heard before, you like to split up, divide, we'll get into this a in the next few slides, but this is the rationale for why we like to put half of our basal insulin uh, or half our insulin as basal and half a bolus while treating hyperglycemia in patient. Um, one more note is that in acute illness, um, total daily insulin requirement may increase um, uh, in spite of the fact that the patient is not eating. And this physiological insulin, this uh, insulin requirement uh, does uh, revert back to baseline as the recovery takes place. There are things like inflammation, acute infection that can uh, really trigger our hyperglycemia and insulin. And once uh, it resolves, it can go back down to normal. All right. So next slide. So next we have our three simple steps in determining, determining our total daily dose or how much insulin to give day to day. Um, and it's important to note that this is exactly what it is. It's an estimate. Um, but this formula and table provides some good, a reasonable starting point and some good guidelines um, if a patient uh, does not have a typical regimen at home or their insulin or their glucose does not match that at home, or you have a patient with stress hyperglycemia or no previous history of diabetes. Um, and it's always important to err on the side of caution. Uh, we want a, uh, we'd rather risk hyperglycemia than hypoglycemia as hypoglycemia can come along with more consequences. So we like to start at uh, 0.5 units uh, per kilogram per day. And based on certain markers, we either add 0.1 units per kilograms per day or subtract it. You can see here that um, if the age is greater than 70. Um, we like to subtract 0.1 units. This is uh, because our elderly population has a higher propensity to hypoglycemia. While they do have a greater amount of insulin resistance, they also have lower amount of uh, other circulating hormones like glucagon. So overall, they have a higher propensity to hypoglycemia, so we want to be more careful in these patients. Renal insufficiency, we also want to decrease 0.1 units. Uh, the kidney plays a very pivotal role in clearing and degrade degradating uh, circulating insulin, and is also a site of insulin action. Um, 
So uh, we probably heard the term many times of insulin stacking. If the kidneys are not functioning optimally, there can be a higher amount of circulating insulin in the body, thus giving us a bigger risk of hypoglycemia. And this is very similar in advanced cirrhosis. Um, in uh, liver disease, the rate at which insulin is uh, degraded in the liver um, is reduced. And this, again, results in increased uh, hyperinsulinemia and hypoglycemia. Um, we decrease your pancreatic deficiency as well. And some instances where we actually increase it is a HbA1c greater than 10%. This is a clear marker of uncontrolled diabetes. And while it's not in the box right here, for patients with uh, signs of insulin resistance, you can consider high requirements up to 0.7 or 0.8 units per kilogram per day, um, adding 0.1 for um, one or two of each of the requirements. This is uh, prolonged hyperglycemia, not responsive uh, to you, uh, the insulin doses you're given. Steroid use, which increases our glucose. Uh, infections, inflammation, inflammatory disorders, and central obesity and uh, signs of diabetes like acanthosis and agricans as well. So as you can see, bottom line, a lot of this is centered around avoiding hypoglycemia as well as treating hyperglycemia. Um, while using these calculations, uh, there's some instances uh, you wanna take note of. Um, NPO and or uncertain oral intake, you don't know how much the patient is eating. You wanna order only basal insulin as a scheduled order, our typical long acting insulin or glargine and uh, correction sliding scale as well. Um, we don't wanna have any standing mealtime insulin as we don't know if they're eating or they're not eating regular meals. And for MDI patients, this is uh, multiple daily injections or patients that use both um, basal and mealtime prandial insulin at home. You wanna reduce 20% um, um, of their home uh, regimen when they are NPO. And if they're especially basal heavy where they're using a lot more um, glargine um, or levomere basal insulin, you can reduce up to 50% even. But if they're eating and otherwise getting nutrition, you can order both basal and bolus insulin as scheduled orders. And it's always good to be cautious with prandial insulin. Um, I know a lot of us, when we admit our patients, um, we are very quick to throw on our sliding scale, not necessarily putting on uh, our long our long acting insulin. Again, a lot of this lecture is to focus on maybe starting them on some long-term insulin, but it's always okay to be cautious with starting mealtime insulin. Um, ideally, the guideline is to begin it on admission, but you can see how they respond um, over one or two to 24 to 48 hours of being in hospital, seeing how much uh, sliding, scale they're, sliding scale they're actually needing at meal times um, while in the hospital before deciding to add or decrease. And uh, why did you say that? You'll see an image later. If many of you probably use our glucose tab in Epic, Epic is really good at tracking um, everything related to um, hyper and hypoglycemia. Uh, it shows our sugar patterns with a nice curve. It shows what insulin is given at what times. Um, and it shows again, both finger stick and serum insulin. So step two in this is apply the basal bolus concept uh, related to our uh, physiological uh, insulin levels. You wanna divide, uh, ideally you like to do 50-50. You can err on the lower side for basal, higher side for nutritional if applicable, but 50-50 is a good place to start. And then you divide the nutritional insulin by three, they're eating three meals a day. And then you have the insulin sliding scale um, as well. And last step is titrating a goal. Um, how you want to adjust each, uh, as you see their uh, sugars um, throughout the um, first parts of their hospital course um, and then daily. Um, for long-acting insulin, you want to only um, change this dose based on fasting um, finger, stick, uh, finger sticks. This is typically why we like to give our um, basal regimen at nighttime. In the morning, we have our fasting glucose. Um, the fasting glucose, uh, or the AM glucose, the typical five to six AM glucose uh, versus the bedtime should not decrease by 50, uh, by 50 when compared to the bedtime. Um, that means if it is, you can bring down your long acting insulin. If there's no decrease at all, or it's actually increasing, you can increase your long acting insulin. And then for a short acting bolus insulin, um, basically, again, looking at that curve to see how much correction is given. Um, if uh, you're maxing out your sliding scale, it might be a good time to add on uh, mealtime insulin and you can increase it by one to four units. Um, and uh, if there's none being used to the sliding scale or you're using too much mealtime insulin where you don't, uh, where it actually brings it down into near hypoglycemic levels, you can decrease it. 
And if none of your goals are being met after much titration, you can recalculate the total daily dose and sliding scale um, and uh, start from the beginning. So with that, we have a few practice cases to go through. Uh, this first one we'll kind of do together. So this is a 60 year old male, type two diabetes, is admitted for pneumonia. His last day when C was 7.4, his home regimen uh, consists of only oral hypoglycemic agents. He weighs 84 kilos and he's on a carb controlled or low sugar diet. Uh, so with this, uh, there's not really answer to give, uh, but kind of what would be the anti-hyperglycemic regimen that you would create and what would you do regarding his home medications as well? Just a brief overview for any, a patient that typically comes in like this. Well, if, yeah, so if, if the patient is otherwise hemodynamically stable and there is no concern, uh, you could uh, potentially continue the home agents. But another alternative is that you just start on uh, insulin sliding scale. Um, the most ideal thing is to do start the basal insulin plus uh, a low dose insulin sliding scale. Um, I don't see in the story that he has um, like cirrhosis or pancreatic insufficiency or renal uh, renal disease. So you can just start with a 0 0.5 uh, milligrams per keg, which would be 42. Oh, wait. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So we went above and beyond with the calculations, but uh, yes. Yeah, so typically what we want to do is we want to hold the oral hypoglycemic agents. Um, again, we like to use insulin just to help us adjust the sugars and see um, how they might respond differently to an acute infection like pneumonia. And then we ordered our basal and bolus. Like you said, um, it would be 42 kilos, 21 basal and uh, 21 bolus, 777. Or as we discussed earlier, um, we can start with the basal and see how much correctional insulin he's using as we do add on the order for correctional sliding scale. Again, the guidelines, um, the ideal practice is to start mealtime insulin, but it's okay to observe for four, about 24, 48 hours. And this is typically when your team will probably get the patients. If you're admitting, um, might be good to start basal and sliding scale and the primary team will take over the care. Um, and then of course, our target of 140 to 180, always good to remember that number. Great. So next, uh, you can uh, re scream out or respond it in the chat with text. Um, so want to estimate the total daily dose for a 76-year-old female with type 2 diabetes, normal renal function, and a weight of 65 kilos. All right, so we have a few with 25, great. So that is the correct answer. Um, we do our, uh, we have our table back up here. The question uh, is 0.5, uh, sorry, 0.5 units. Um, the risk factor is that she is over 70, no other risk factors, no other signs of insulin resistance. So we do 0.4 times 65 and we get 25 units. Next question. Um, so again, another total daily dose, we have a 60 year old male, type two diabetes, last A1C of 12%, a weight of 100 kilos admitted for cellulitis. His exam is remarkable for central adiposity and acanthosis nigricans, and his fasting finger, finger stick glucose on arrival is greater than 180. Let's say it's 202. How much, what would be your total daily dose of insulin? Okay, so we have a few responses uh, with 60. Um, however, in this, in this uh, scenario, you might consider um, 70 or 80. Um, why is this? Uh, again, he has a HbA1c of greater than 10%, but he has a lot of these risk factors uh, for insulin resistance, including um, a weight of over 100 kilos, central adiposity, acanthosis nigricans, and he has an active infection of cellulitis. So um, while you don't want to go overboard, um, about 0.7 to 0.8 um, would be a good uh, starting total daily dose here. 
So next we have another practice case. Uh, you're starting your shift as a night flow resident, as we all love to do. You receive a page from the nursing staff regarding a 65 year old obese female, type two diabetes, has an A1C of 7.9, and she's admitted from Elena. She's gonna get a scope tomorrow, so we, you um, were signed out to have NPO at midnight, and hopefully the order was already in. You review her home medications. She's on uh, Glargine, our basal insulin, 80 units at bedtime. And she's on mealtime insulin, 15 units at, at breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So in addition to starting a sliding scale every six hours while NPO, again, six hours because our bolus insulin lasts about four to six hours, what would be the most appropriate dose of Glargine while she remains NPO? All right. Responses are flying in. D is the correct answer here. Oops. So as I mentioned before, um, while NPO, we do wanna reduce our basal insulin by at least 20%. And if they are basal heavy, as this patient is, um, we can reduce it up to 50%. So uh, at mealtime, standing, cranial, uh, standing cranial insulin coverage should be discontinued while NPO. We have our sliding scale on every six hours uh, in order to ensure um, our uh, routine ap um, application of any uh, needed uh, sliding, uh, short acting insulin. So yes, the correct answer is we would uh, decrease our glargine to 60 units and use our sliding scale. All right. And next, there's an actual patient I had pretty recently. You're on the floors and you received a patient screened out of the ICU for DKA. Um, the ion, uh, anion gap is closed um, and he has been weaned from his insulin drip temporarily used in the ED. This is a 79 year old man. He has a history of diabetes, uh, di type two diabetes, CVA with residual left-sided weakness um, and he's nonverbal um, and high blood pressure. He initially presented for AMS and dysphagia. So he's currently NPO. Uh, uh, his current insulin regimen at home is Lantus 10 units bedtime and sliding scale. Sorry, his current insulin regimen coming from the ED is Lantus uh, 10 units and sliding scale Q6 hours. Um, his glucose curve is as follows in the first three days. So what I've circled here is um, the fasting glucose. First day was 323, here was 248, here was 270. You can see here He's getting the 10 units um, of Lantus. And you can see that he is getting um, a lot of sliding scale over here. This might be a combined two different uh, doses every Q6 hours. So my question to you is, what adjustments would you make to the insulin regimen at this point? Again, he's on 10 units Lantus and Q6 hour sliding scale. Okay, so we have a lot of A's here. So in this case, the correct answer would actually be B. And if we see this, uh, you wanna increase the, the glargy and uh, continue with the sliding scale. And if you can see this throughout the, uh, throughout this time, besides this dip here, his glucose curve is relatively flat, meaning he's not spiking in terms of his sugars. They're all relatively within a short range, especially they're not spiking after all these Q6 hours when the sliding scale wears off. You might see in some patients on the floors who are eating um, every three meals, um, they might have these giant spikes all at mealtime. And that's a time where you actually do want to add um, standing uh, mealtime or standing um, short acting insulin in general. But you can see here, once we started increasing um, the Lantus dose, first from 14 and then to 18, his fasting sugars actually just uh, started to come down. And while his curve uh, maintained um, a relatively uh, flat, um, flat picture, I guess let's say. And you can see that um, his sliding scale doses compared to previously actually decreased along with it. In fact, in these past last 48 hours, he actually did not need any correctional insulin. So that's why the answer there is B. So just go over um, a few last discharge recommendations. If you had the pleasure to work on endocrine consults, which we probably all have at this point already, you probably have used Dr. Agarwal's um, uh, forms, uh, I guess forms or 
notes for uh, admitting uh, new hyper or new diabetic patients and then a follow up note. And you can see that at the bottom of his note, he always includes these discharge recommendations for providers. Um, so you can feel free to go on my Epic and add this, add this smart field and you'll see that as well, but I'll just go over some. So first is you wanna review the insulin injection technique. Um, people on insulin home may know this already, but in some cases, especially new diabetics with high HbA1c um, or those who um, will be on insulin in general, uh, you wanna review the technique for them. And it's a uh, very simple, it's a good teach back technique. I can go over that with any um, one at any time, but you can also ask the fellows. There are fake supplies in the, uh, both the fellows room at West and Morningside that you can practice with as long as a fake fat pad. Um, so it's always important to review that uh, with either the patient or whoever would be administering the insulin. Next is to inquire about barriers to medication. Um, and. Um, also barriers to getting medication or just being adherent with their medication. Uh, we all know how expensive insulin is. Um, we all know that people, may, uh, some of our patients may not have the insurance that covers these insulin. So you'll see at the bottom of this note, um, there are alternatives you can prescribe, but you do wanna see if patients can actually get this insulin or any oral hyper, anti-hyperglycemic medications uh, they may need. So you can talk with social work um, and they can help you out on that instance as well. Um, or if they need someone to help administer insulin or um, other, other barriers uh, that may be included. And next is uh, some common prescriptions we like to give for discharge, especially in patients uh, taking insulin. So you wanna check glucose um, at least four times a day. I know not every patient does that, but uh, before meals um, or with meals and at bedtime. And our great patients will come in uh, with a log and that helps us a lot. Uh, we know that some patients may not uh, do this proactively, but that's also why we have the HbA1c to give us our good average. Um, blood glucose meters, there's lots of them. Um, whatever matches their insurance, the generic works well. You want to give uh, test strips, uh, the lancets, and then alcohol swabs. And these numbers uh, fill out a relative three-month supply. Um, it also is great um, if they don't have someone who actively follows them for diabetes, whether primary care and endocrinologist. Um, you can always type in that PCL to schedule out with endocrinology um, here or schedule with yourself at the Ryan Center because after this, you're going to get, you're going to know a good deal about uh, prescribing insulin. And um, lastly, just confirming a different formulary coverage for certain diabetic agents. Uh, for long acting, we have our Basaglar, we have our Lantus, our Levamir, our Traceba. Traceba is one of the newer long acting insulins. It's a long chain polymer. Um, it actually lasts a little bit longer. I believe it's 24 to 28 hours, or a little bit longer. And this is helpful for people who forget to take their medication on time every day. Um, it'll allow a little bit of overlap to be taken at different times uh, throughout the day. Um, but it still works like insulin, it, uh, like long acting insulin, no peak and uh, relatively uh, steady control. Next we have uh, Admalog or Humalog or Novalog. This is all our, Lant our, our list pro or short acting insulins. And then uh, the BD NanoPen is the little small um, injection for the insulin. And if you're unable to prescribe pens based on insurance or the patient prefers um, a needle and syringe uh, and vial method, you can do that as well. And these are some common prescriptions. So just some take home points I wanna go over. Hyperglycemia, again, it's very common in the hospital situation, uh, whether with, pa with pa patients with or without diabetes and certainly can be exacerbated by uh, illness our medications and be in the hospital setting. And uh, there can be uh, high mor morbidity and mortality rates uh, associated uh, with hyperglycemia and therefore wanna require active management. Um, our target glucose, always good to remember 140 to 180, that's what we like. Um, it's a good target range for managing both uh, inpatient in the non-critical and critical setting as observed in the nice sugar study. And then of course, the biggest thing while hyperglycemia increases risk of infection or increases risk of morbidity and mortality, hypoglycemia um, is very serious as well in this. Um, so everything should be done to rigorously avoid hypoglycemia. Remember, it's always good to give a little bit of insulin and add more whether, um, rather than to give way too much insulin and have to titrate down uh, once you're getting into a hypoglycemic range. So with that, um, I have the QR code here um, for our post survey. It'd be great if you take it. It's about five minutes long. It's one of my favorite gifs from Park and Rec, diabetes, let's diabetes. this. Um, and hopefully uh, with all this information, you'll be diabeting this on the floors.
So uh, thanks for uh, listening. Get a snack to increase your uh, glucose levels, your nutritional glucose and nutritional insulin. And please answer the survey if you would. It'll help with our uh, research project. That was an excellent presentation, Max. Thank you so much. I had a few pearls that I wanted to share. And of course, um, this is sort of trial and error. Sometimes it feels like you don't really know, you can't predict how your patient is going to respond to uh, insulin treatment. And particularly when we're starting insulin, whether it's like basal or basal bolus, um, it's, it may be good to try to calculate an insulin sensitivity factor in one of these patients that just kind of unexpectedly um, respond different than what we um, thought they would to insulin treatment. Now, one of the things that I, I read in the chat and I'm, everything we have um, to do in terms of patients with type two diabetes, we may take with a grain of salt. And we have to be particularly careful when we're titrating insulin. Um, sometimes it's easier, um, safer to start up titrating maybe one, two units um, at a time if we don't know exactly how your patient, like the case you presented, right, Max? You, had a, um, you know, insulin, I'm sorry, a glucose level in the 200s, and then suddenly um, you were able to um, see the levels come down quite rapidly. Now, one of the things that we need to be aware of is by the end of your insulin titration, your bedtime and your fasting glucose should ideally be very similar. If you're dropping your glucose by more than 50, um, I guess, our unit would be milligrams per deciliter at a time then that means that your basal insulin is probably too high. So you, uh, even though want to get these patients to their goal, um, you might want to do it slowly and make sure that you're not um, you know, over correcting with insulin or over, um, there's a word in Spanish for this, I cannot say it in English, but you're not overdoing the um, basal insulin. Um, that's great though, I think. <laughs> It is pretty helpful and everyone seems to get the answers right. I hope that the post survey will show that as well. Yes. Does so anyone that, have a question? Oh, sorry, Mark. I was just gonna say that some of the questions in the post survey are actual board questions. So hopefully yeah. you get them. <laughs> I mean, that's a huge topic in the board. Um, so I hope this helps too. Does anyone have any questions? Hi, can I ask a question? Absolutely. Sure. Uh, thanks for the presentation, that was really good. I just want to um, clarify for the basal heavy patients. Do you have like a cutoff that you use, or is it just like what? How do you conceive that? Oh well, you can see that um, like back in that patient, the patient had about where was it? Um, Eighty units at bedtime and Lispro. So uh, they're getting uh, total. They're getting forty-five uh, with bolus eighty. So that's about versus our typical fifty-fifty. That's about um, two thirds versus one third. Um, I, I mean, I do, like I said earlier on, uh, we like to do 50 to 60%. So probably once it gets over about a 60, 65% um, use of basal versus bolus, that's what we would probably consider basal heavy. Any other questions? If not, I'll also put the uh, post survey in the chat. I'll send a in, in our regular chat and probably send an email to help the first years answer it again as well. Um, if you have any other separate questions, always feel free to reach out. Um, also to Kirthana and Sananda as well. Uh, we all wanna be good budding endocrinologists. So uh, thanks again, everyone.